Nice. And you're on the river now. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. Thanks for joining me again. I have Kosha Kimlet, who is joining me from Orlando, Florida, for our Startup Without Burnout series. And Kosha is awesome. He's been a friend of mine for over a decade now. Yeah. Wow. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I just realized that. So he is known as the business magician. He's a world-renowned entertainer and keynote speaker who teaches audiences how to think like a magician. Kostya has presented his sophisticated brand of ma magic for thinking audiences in over 200 cities on five continents. Um, in 2006, Kostya was the youngest magician to appear on the cover of Magic Magazine, which is a leading industry publication. And as an entrepreneur, Kostya founded See Magic Live, which trains and books magicians for events across the country. I've seen him go to places like Lanzarote, Spain, and crazy European cities that I had never even heard of, as well as touring the country. So he is always, always busy. His company's local team has served as uh, the magicians for the NBA's Orlando Magic since 2010. On stage for corporations like NASA and GE, Kostya unravels centuries-old principles of perception and secrets of communication, empowering people to be more effective in their business and everyday lives. And most recently, this is my little brag ability for him, so I, like I said, I've been friends with him for a long time, and I got to watch him uh, fool the uh, famous Vegas duo Penn & Teller on their hit CWTV show, Penn & Teller Fool Us and became the closing act for their show at the Rio Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. That was this past year. So, yeah. yay, Kosha, thank you <laughs> so much for doing this. My absolute pleasure to be here with you. Thanks. Yay! And I'm just gonna go ahead and jump into some of the questions because I, I know you've been in business for yourself for you know 20 some odd years, but I think that you offer a, a different viewpoint than a lot of entrepreneurs do. And I think that, um, as an artist and as a creative, you're going to be able to give a lot of uh, insight that hasn't been said yet. <laughs> so, yeah, I, was, I was so excited to hear about everyone you were interviewing. We were talking about how, you know, I'm, I'm a solopreneur, but I've, I've built a company and I've helped so many others, but it's really, I think the journey that I've gone through as, as an immigrant and coming to America and, and creating something out of nothing, I hope that some of the things that just I have done will be helpful to others. That's certainly always a hope to inspire and, and to help and to give back what we've gotten over the years. So I think this is great. Oh, absolutely. See, I love it when everybody tries to do better and help everybody else. It makes yeah. me happy. So, um, first question really is just how did it start? Like, how did you realize that you wanted to be an entrepreneur or a business owner? You know, it's, it started that when I was already doing it, I started magic as a hobby. I saw it on television. I went to the library, I did a book report on Houdini and I was in love with it. And people started hiring me when I was 15 and 16. And I just saved up that money. And I remember I invested back into magic books and just gaining more knowledge and traveling and meeting other magicians. And I did that all through high school and when I started college. So that two years into college, when I was about 19, 20, I kind of looked at it and I said, well, I, I guess it already is a business in a way because my clients that have been hiring me before, I hire me again and again. And so if I can just continue to build every year and retain 20% of my client base and continue more and more, hey, this is a real business. So it kind of happened in a good time in my life where I didn't have stress and bills to pay. A lot of people who have the decision to start off on their own business or not are worried because do they have enough savings? Can they go out there? But I think one of the good things that happened is that I was able to incubate and let the art and the product develop without stress of the market. And then by the time I was ready to hit the market, it was already kind of, you know, had its own steam and, and was going well. Well, that actually leads me right into the next one. So, so because you had that opportunity to incubate, as you say, what, what was that time that you hit real financial success and you were like, okay, this is, this is paying my bills. I'm good. You know, it's like everyone has their own level of what they need. And I've certainly met other artists who I remember telling me that like, oh, I've got enough um, events booked. I'm done for the month. I don't need to work anymore. And that mindset didn't make sense to me then because I thought, well, wouldn't you want to become bigger? Wouldn't you want to do more? And so because my family moved from Kiev, Ukraine to Orlando, Florida, and we have, it's the number one most visited city in the U.S. And we have such a large convention market. There's so many events. Hello, dog. <laughs> the dog is apparently saying something. Give me a second. <laughs> Two seconds. This will be edited out. Okay. Uh -huh. 
Jennifer's in there cracking up. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we can start over with that. Um, do you want to start over? How do you want to, how will you yeah, edit that? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just ask the question again on where you, where you found success. It looked like you cut me off because I was talking so damn much. <laughs> I mean, if you were shorter, by the way, I did a video interview two weeks ago, and my only lesson from that is that I need to talk less, so I, I should talk less. So. Whatever, you're so silly, you're fine. So, okay, so that, that leads me to the next question pretty well, though. So, so you had that time to incubate and sort of save and reinvest and reinvest. So at what level or what point or how long did it take you to hit uh, a level of financial independence where this, this is paying for your bills? This is, this is what you're doing now. Well, you know, it's different for every business and it's certainly different for every industry. And my clients, I have my clients in every single industry because I started off with entertainment before I went to speaking and training. And so I have a variety of clients. So I talk to my restaurant clients, it's like a three year window where they plan to lose money for the first three years and then figure out what's going to happen by year three. Um, with my business, again, it was able to sustain itself early on because I didn't have that much overhead. But when I, when I started teaching other artists how to grow their business, I would tell them that your willingness to spend should reflect your confidence to earn. So when you look at what you're going to make, what you think you're going to make next year based on your projections of what you did this year and how many clients you've had, then how brave are you? And you should be brave enough to say, I'm willing to spend 10, 20, 30% of that. I think the biggest difficulty that artists and solopreneurs have is getting that upfront investment going. And so it's either your time or your money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was, it was probably 10 years that I did it as a hobby. And then eventually it was like really working for me, but I've had 17 years of consistent growth. So since I've been keeping track of it, it every year has gotten better and better. And I think the number one reason for that is because I've always reinvested as much as possible back into education, back into learning and into building my company. That's awesome. So, so the answer is it'll be different for everyone, but as long as you continue to invest and a, a book that was recently recommended to me is called Profits First. It's um, something that I've been doing is making sure you pay yourself first, set aside for taxes and everything else yep. is a much better way than just saying, what are my expenses and spending your money nonstop? Absolutely. And that's, that's what I've always done too, is always make sure that you've got enough to pay yourself, pay the bills that you have to pay, you know, pay the people that are inside your, your bubble and that make up your team yep. and then figure the rest. So yeah, absolutely. So what do you feel then is the best action step that our viewers that are thinking about either starting their own company or leveling up in what they've got right now should be implementing as soon as possible in order to grow their business? You know, if you're leveling up, then it's about the people that you're around. You, you have to realize that if you're going to grow, the only way your company's going to grow is if the, the number of people grow. And, and that's a conscious choice. And some of us decide to go that route. And some of us decide that, no, I'm going to stick with being a solopreneur and work with just independent um, contractors around the country through online to do certain projects. But if you're going to grow your business, of course, it's a matter of just people and getting the right, the right people in the right place. Talking more to solopreneurs, um, you know, I think it just comes down to if you're going to continue doing this for the rest of your life, just like exercise or good eating habits, it's got to be something that you choose of your own volition and it's not something that you're forcing yourself to do, that you're not saying, okay, but if I only get this, if I only suffer for this bit, then I'll get there, okay. I think from the very beginning, you have to start with finding what you really enjoy, what you wake up in the morning wanting to do. And I remember when I was in my early 20s, waking up and I didn't want to answer my emails, and I didn't want to make any phone calls, but I thought, wait a minute, I have a show a week from now, I can practice this magic trick, and I spent four hours practicing this magic trick. And I realized that that four hours contributed just as much to my business as the phone calls would, but it made me much more fulfilled because as an artist and as, as a magician entertainer from the beginning, Hey, I got, I just get to practice and play. So if you can play and you can work and you can combine it too, that'll be the most important thing. Cool. All right. So <laughs> you're going to love this question then. Um, so most of the successful people I've been speaking with have some sort of a routine. And I think I already have an idea of what you're going to say. <laughs> but yes. um, can you share what your routine is, like daily or, or you know? You know, so, okay, so your routine has to revolve around your business, right? And so there's two sides to my business, okay? Show business. I have a lot of routines around my show. And I have routines set in place that are in place before I go on stage or before I go out and meet an audience. There's routines in how I pack and how I travel and how I arrive. 
And so I've taken my business extremely seriously as an artist, starting with reading E-Myth Revisited and realizing that I had to shape my business like a franchise model. And so I did all those things so that in life, I wouldn't have to have any routines. <laughs> I, I don't enjoy it. I enjoy the reality. I, I thrive with that. I mean, behind me is random stuff I've taped to the wall and painted and different things. And so like, I just need a variety of things to keep me excited. And I've learned, the business side of me has learned that you need systems and you need things in place that'll keep you working. So I've learned what my weaknesses are and I've set people and systems in place to make sure to, to help me operate on those things. Mm -hmm. And then I get to uh, enjoy the variety of life, wake up in, a, in different cities, different weeks, meet different people, meet different audiences. To me, the most exciting thing is performing for the people that I've met. Cause you know, like any company, you've sold your same product a million times. I've done the same magic tricks tens of thousand times, but it's different for this person. And that's what I thrive on. That's, that's the variety. So, so with that in mind, the good answer is that, yes, I do have a lot of systems in place that revolve around my business, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to wake up at a certain time every morning or I'm going to run, I'm going to do this. Life is too joyful and exciting. I like keeping it open for spontaneity. Um, but as soon as I get a gig, I'm on time. All the systems are in place. I will deliver at the top notch to my clients so that I can be a slacker the rest of the time. Yeah, you're super diplomatic with that. He's, yeah. yeah. And, and don't let him fool you guys. He put all of these, um, these systems and these, these step-by-step -step processes in place years ago. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I used to do data entry for him when I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I would put things in and I would see all of the sequences and, and processes in place prior to him even contacting somebody. And, and doing business development and following up. And, and just because he doesn't live by a set schedule does not mean that there's no routine in his life. However, he is a slacker and he does like to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you're so funny, but you remind me of that too. I just remember, you're right, when, we, when you started working for us, you were one of the first people that I had worked with me. And I was like, okay, I can do more when I have other people working with me. Oh. And, and putting aside, putting in those systems and places, what I did was I just learned lessons from every other business. Here I was an artist, a solopreneur, just funding everything, bootstrapping it. But my clients were Fortune 500 companies and I was traveling to their conventions and their meetings, talking to their CEOs. And so I said, I have to take my artistic business just as seriously as they do their sales force of 300 people. I've got to bring the same you know, seriousness to it and intensity and thought. And, um, you know, it was, man, it was wild effort. It's easy to get burned out. But luckily, as an artist, I learned that there's, art in business yeah. there's an art to those systems mm -hmm. and so i really learned to not think of them as just off oh, numbers and boring but but i found the human element in it and um and it's always tweaking like literally never ends never ends yeah absolutely and and i love that you just said that because it leads me right to the question of what's the number one thing that will prevent burnout because you've been doing this a hell of a lot longer than i have and you've been doing it successfully. So I think that you're the perfect person to say that. So let me, maybe let me look at burnout in then in both the artistic side and the business side. On the artistic side, um, when I went to college, my first year of college, I dropped out of magic, so to say. I still did a couple shows, but I didn't participate in it. And I learned and I got advice from other older mentors that that's okay and that happens. So in whatever your craft may be, in whatever you might be doing, you have to respect that you'll reach burnout and then what you have to do is you have to look at it and say, well, why is there burnout? Is it, I'm no longer challenged by the process? Does it no longer bring me joy? What is it about it? And then, you know, art, artistically or in, in craft and whatever it is you're doing all day long, it may be, you know, reading legal documents and you found joy in that in college, but now you don't anymore. Or maybe analyzing spreadsheets, whatever it may be, writing. So, so look for what inspired you in the first place and go back to that and remove the stress that comes from having to do it for a living or paying the bills. If you can separate them, isolate the art or craft, whatever you're doing and still enjoy it, then you shouldn't be burnt out. And if you are, it's okay to come back. Business wise, um, I, you know, you're, you're not, you shouldn't get burnt out if you have the right staff helping you take care of things. You're getting burnt out if you're doing things that you're not good at. And a part of that is just willing to admit what you're not good at. And, and finding people that do. And then, and this is the kind of things that I was still learning about is managing those people as well. We're managing the things that you're not doing. 
So there's so many multiple levels to it. And um, yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, the easy answer is just do what you love. But I know I've heard from so many people like, well, I don't, I don't do that. And it's difficult to say, well, find what you love. But at the same time, I wish everyone could. Yeah. I want everyone to do that. Absolutely. Uh, it changes everything. When you enjoy what you do every single day and you get up and you're excited for what's going to happen next, huge difference. Huge. I tell my clients when they, when they talk about price, I say that the show's free. I get paid to practice and prepare and to travel. But the show, I'll pay you to have a, a thousand people laughing, applauding, and having fun. And I'm on stage. This is like the best part of my day. Come on, <laughs> right? But it's all the, what people don't see is all the dozens and dozens and, you know, hours, days, months of work. And the other thing is that it, it does build on itself. With any business, you know, my dad gave me the best piece of advice ever when I first started. This piece of advice got me through so much. He said, the first year of business, you're working for your business. The second year of business, you're working together. And the third year, your business is working for you. And, no, and, and it may not be years, but he told me, and that was kind of like the way I looked at my business. All right. So I, to me, I look like I just spent the last 20 years working for my business. Yeah. And, but, you know, if you break it down, I can say like, hey, well, then there was five years we're working together, struggling. And then finally, last five years, it's been working for me where the calls are coming in and the shows are coming in. And it's just because of the momentum. Absolutely. That's amazing. And okay. So we know what your dad and how, how he thinks, and we know how your business process has been going, but how do you basically convey thinking like a magician to the startups and the, and the business practices that bring that creative side and, and the perception that you teach throughout? So, so really, so that's a deep question that we can take in so many ways. So the way I help my my clients, right, is they usually have conferences and there are a lot of them are franchise owners, they're business owners, they either have a sales force or they have franchise owners that they bring together once or several times a year. They need to empower them, engage them and give them really valuable content. So what I do is I study my clients, I figure out what it is that they're trying to achieve with their sales force for that year, what their goals are, and then I look at what are the messages that I can deliver. I spent 10 years delivering, developing this content when I first started, my business partner was 40 years older than I am, and we just met every week and just developed, literally took us five years to figure out, well, what is this, what are we talking about, to realize it's perception is the biggest driver in everything. And so when I talk about thinking like, like a magician, I talk about the role of perception, it depends on whether you're marketing and sales or you're the executive. But the overarching point is that perception is the key to everything. And people don't act on the reality of the situation, but they act on their perception of reality. And when I ask my clients, does perception play a role in your business? They always say, it's everything. Yep. So if it's everything, then what are you doing about it? And what I do is I take my clients to the process where we identify what's being perceived. Is it their brand? Is it their personal name? Is it their product? Is it stores? What are all the avenues of perception, the corridors? And then which ones are really good and which ones are weak? So that's what I do for my clients on my own side. And as an individual person, when you look at, okay, how do I think like a magician or what does that even mean? Well, who's your audience? That's the first question. Who is your audience? Identifying who they are, identifying what they see about your business and is what they're perceiving, what you want them to, to see and to perceive and to remember and to anticipate and to understand how are they processing that information? So that's with branding and marketing and your sales message, but it also works internally where, okay, we have a company that this is our goal, but then are, internally are we communicating that to all of our people? What's the perception of our office team and of our code of ethics and our vision and mission? Is it really what we created it in that you know, meeting? Are the employees getting it? So, so that would be the question I'd ask the, the audience here. Is what role does perception play in your business? And then maybe I'll give you one other little tidbit is, and this I, I, I'm about to do a presentation for 200 small business owners and this is going to be the main thing. We're going to spend an hour just talking about method and effect. Because to me, that's the way I saw magic is I learned that there's a method of what you do, but the audience never sees. And then there's the effect that the audience perceives, but isn't really real. So what's real is never seen. And what isn't real is what's remembered. And that's how magic works. And so it's crazy. <laughs> It is, it is crazy. Exactly. So we act on the invisible and we ignore what's real and we create alternate realities. And that's how we make all of our 
decisions and processes. That's what consumers do. That's what employees do. So well, the exercise that I take people through is I have them identify what are all the methods that I'm doing in my day-to-day -day life and in my business. And then what of those methods are seen by my audience and which of them are not. And then what's my effect? And then, and then you look at what is it really that I am doing? And, and it's kind of like the question, what business am I really in? And so, you know, take yourself on a Socratic dialogue, ask yourself deeper questions and, and consider is the perception that people have of myself and my business, the perception that I want them to have. I love that. All right. Well, Hey, we're running out of a little bit of time. I know he's a magician. It's crazy. So, but I, I love what, where you're going with that. And I know that we are later tonight going to actually send out a link to everybody that's uh, viewing this. And I just want to let you know, or, or have you let them know exactly what that is and how they can get a little bit better about thinking like a magician and dealing with perception. Yeah, absolutely. We'll send you a link to the website. You'll get a chance to, there's some blogs, there's some essays on there, and there may even be a little chapter of the forthcoming book, Think Like a Magician, something to tease you just to give you a taste. So, you know, right now I, I, I'm busy with travels and performances, and so I hope that the people who are watching it will want to connect and, and sign up online just so we can stay in touch. And when I get to put even more information out there, I can let the world know. I, I love, as a magician, I get applause, it's great, but as a speaker, as a corporate trainer, I get to really make a difference and it's so much more fulfilling and it's amazing what we can do online now and connect to so many others. Um, you know, to me, I'm just literally an immigrant came to America, living the American dream, doing magic tricks for a living. And now I've created a business that supports a hundred other artists around the country and creates opportunities for others. And literally if I can do it, anyone can do it. And as funny as that sounds, it's, it's hundred percent true. It's all about having a passion and wanting to put the work into it and, and waking up and seeing the abundance of resources that are out there and going forth and, and doing what you love and making the world a better place. Oh, I love it. Kostya, thank you so much for joining me with this. I really appreciate it. And I know that I always get so much out of when you and I talk and I'm hoping everybody else does too, because he's amazing guys. Um, go check him out at thinkmagic.com. That's still the website. Yeah. Oh, uh, think magic is still around, but actually you go to uh, K magic is the short oh. one. So kmagic.com or Kostya Kimlat. I got a bunch, but Kostya Kimlat, K O S T Y A. K-I-M-L-A-T dot com. There you go. All right, guys. Take it easy. See you next time. Kosha. Thanks. My pleasure. See ya. Bye.